accurate to cancel a contract like that. It's not a crime. Well, That's yeah, that that's part of your user license license agreement when you accept taking rides with strangers. Okay, so Dad. I can have an officer come out. <laughs> That's what happens you when you take rides with strangers. <laughs> I can send an officer out there, but what do you expect them to do? Okay. I just wanted you to be aware that dude can't, threw me out of a lift. <laughs> Oh, there she is. Okay, this is Joanne. It seems like a pretty um, progressive human being. Okay. Oh, Portland. Okay, well, I guess that's all we really needed to know, right? She's from Portland. Okay. <laughs> Gun them up. 2 p.m. EST. So in uh, less than oh, 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes, we got Mark Wood coming up. We're going to talk about um, mandatory masks or maybe not even that. The restrictions on the lockdown on the restaurant industry. Mark's got a few restaurants, the Grantham House, the office, and what else? 40, I don't know. I should do my research before I get these guys in here. But he did a good interview with... Chrissy Sadowski today on 610. And I will say, Chrissy, nice job. You're actually better than most of the regulars that get paid the big bucks. And I know what they pay over there. It's not great. So I know you're doing it maybe because you love it. I'm sure you do. It is pretty cool. The radio industry, the whole background of it, uh, the whole synergy of the news department and everything. Man, I, I loved it. We'll put the Zoom call down here when Mark comes in. Anyways, Mark was on with Chrissy Sadowski today, who's filling in for Shelby Norris, who's filling in for Tim Dennis, who's a regular. And he was great. He carried the conversation, and I want to go more in depth, uh, see what the impact is on him. These are your new cases in Canada. I use worldmeters.info because when you put stats out there, if you don't have the right stats, everyone climbs up your ass saying, oh, nice uh, website stats. This is a website. I don't think it's an organization that just has a website. I think this is a website, info-based website, period. But because I see many other um, media sources, I was going to say news, but we can't really call what they're reporting news these days, especially if you're local to the Niagara region. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, we had a little jam here last night with uh, a few unnamed friends. All signed a waiver when they came in that they would not disclose the location or the people that were here. We had a solid jam. And for no one that missed my show last night at 7 o'clock, I'm sorry, I um, bailed, and I didn't give notice, and that's not cool. So normally we're 7 p.m., but throwing in more content here, like today. So last night during the jam, which is a, just a manly bullshit session sometimes, and I say manly only because that's who is coming out lately, I guess. I haven't put the invite out there to many girls. Um, okay, so here's the daily cases. I'm going to hover over this so you can see. Okay, so this is the first wave we see in March. It starts climbing. And then the cases at the height, let's say, the peak, okay, they're in around 1,800. Okay, we have one day that's off the charts, which is usually an, an anomaly, I think, when it comes to stats. If you have one that's that big, it's probably due to reporting or something like that. So let's go through the peak here, right? And this is what I want to know. When's the first peak hit? Because after the peak, it's all downhill there, right? Until the next wave comes. Now, apparently you always get the waves in this type of thing. And the virus, does it mutate? It, it definitely lessens in strength, right? 
not only that, we're getting better at treating it. So I, I, here, I found a couple things I want to show you here. So in the first wave, this is Canadian cases, right? Daily new cases. I don't want totals. I want dailies. So you can see in here at the height, we're up around 1,800, 16, 17, 1,800 in here. Okay. Now, if you go down just a few graphs, they sh you, can, you can map these. You can, I wish you could map them over top of each other. You can see the same period of time. Now we're talking deaths. Okay, so deaths are right up, let's call it 200. Didn't quite make it there most of the time. There's that one spike. I'm not sure what that was, but let's call it in here. We're looking like 160, 175. Let's call it 200. All right. Based on this many cases daily. All right. Now let's go over here. This is today, or November 10th, let's say, November 12th, 5,000 cases. Okay, so we're in and around, let's call it four, just to be safe. Res we stead steadily risen to the 4,000 mark. Now look at this. Look at the deaths. Okay, so by my math, I just did this quickly today. Okay, here we have a couple thousand. Here we have 4,000. Here we have 200 deaths, let's call it. Here we have 100. So by my calculations, we have four times the infections that we had in the first wave. Here's we got daily cases. So 2,000, 4,000, let's call it just roughly. Down here, deaths, 200 to 50. 2,000 infections, 200 deaths daily, roughly. 4,000 infections, 50 deaths. Why is no one talking about the fact that we're getting better at treating this? That you need to stay conscious that you need to practice hygiene, social distancing, and leave us the hell alone. Can we go back to work? <laughs> Seriously. My heart is breaking on the daily multiple times because I can't believe that so many people blindly follow supposed science that they haven't even researched themselves with so much information out there you folks are falling hook, line, and sinker for lockdowns, for masks. And I think they're not only not helping, <laughs> I think they're having a negative effect. And I don't think you'll see the, the effect of wearing a mask, both socially and physically, for a long time. It's a mask experiment, a mask human experiment, a mass human experiment. So anyway, people are really afraid, and that's the media's fault. The recovery rate of this thing is way over 99%. Why? Are we treating this any different than the flu? Yes, it's more contagious. Yes, it's a little bit more deadly. And I say like marginally more deadly. It's not like if it was as deadly as it is contagious, we'd have a huge problem. And this is what we base the lockdowns on, a 4 to 7% mortality rate. If we had a 4 to 7% mortality rate, that would be serious. Unfortunately, our mortality rates less than half a percent. And there's so much misinformation, so much we don't know yet. Can we admit that no one's an expert on this? No one knows it. <laughs> Listen, as soon as you touch your mask, it's garbage. We got a new one. I don't, you don't hang them from the mirror on your car and reuse them. You touch it, it's done. You know, and everyone's saying, oh, well, you know, tell that to surgeons. Surgeons scrub down. Maybe somebody else puts their mask on. I don't know, but they don't touch the mask after it's on. You ever see a surgeon walking around with his hands up in the air? 
They just don't want droplets going in wounds. And the idea that this is an error, um, transmit aerosol, what's the word for something that's transmitted through the air? I want to say, you know, something to do with aerosol. This is not how the main transmission of this flu is transmitted. You, are, you have almost a 0% chance of walking by somebody that's infected out in the open outside and catching it. <laughs> Unless they cough right in your face or one of your orifices or you touch them, this is how it's spread. By contact, I actually had somebody formerly of the health in the health care system that told me the main transmission of this virus is is through the air. <laughs> Wrong. Like you don't need to be a rocket surgeon to know that it's human contact. Yeah, and if the droplets are coming out, if you're sneezing and hacking and coughing and they land on stuff and then you touch that stuff, yeah, it's still through contact. You're not transmitting. You know how difficult it is to get an airborne virus? It's not easy. <laughs> like you have to be almost hit with it in one of your orifices. Mark Wood coming up. <sighs> We're going to talk about the restaurant restaurant industry. You can check me here on the Jim Fannin Show on Instagram. I'm not all that uh, active there. I'll tell you, murder was a great conversation. I got one minute clips up on there. I don't go live on Instagram. There's no way for that. Uh, Lucas, shout out, brother. Come on the show. Love to talk to you. Changes coming to Black Sheep Lounge, blah, blah, blah. I'll hit some of that later. Uh, share it if you like it. Oh, go check out uh, this link here. Kate Sinopoli, friend of mine, uh, just dropped some Christmas music. It's sweet. And the local stations are carrying it. Nice job. I didn't know what she was talking about, giving her advice. But, yeah, I guess I helped her out. Cool. Alex Jones came out with Michael Malice on uh, TimCast IRL. I'm only about 40 minutes into it. I want to listen to that stuff in the background. Here's my one-year anniversary from blowing up my YouTube channel because I rode the coattails of grapes. Grapes got fired. I carried it. It got mega, mega action here and on YouTube. And I... I worked it into uh, monetizing it. Looks like Mark is in. Let's check in with him. I admit. Mark Wood, what is up, my brother? Hopefully we'll have everything work. Hey, brother, how are you? Can you hear me all right? Uh, He's just connecting. My brother. We'll record in here. We got your mic levels up. I think you should be good, man. You got it. You got me. Can you hear me, bro? How we doing? Oh, good, man. We're live right now, my brother. Thanks for taking the time. I'm just going to make sure our levels are right. Sure enough. Can you hear me all right, man? You can hear me fine, though. I can. Thank you. All right. Uh, come in here. All right, brother. I cut your uh, episode, your interview today on six ten. Well done. I thought uh, I was just saying, Chrissy actually is coming through a lot better than some of the paid uh, regulars on that station these days. Anyways, I don't need you. To yeah, come. I was. Uh, I was impressed when she did her uh, her signing, and she was discussing how she was replacing someone else that was supposed to be there, who was actually supposed to be replacing someone else that was supposed to be there. And I'm like, wow, is anybody doing any work over there? Shelby Knox is supposed to be covering for Tim Dennis, I believe, is the or the <laughs> chain of command. And I was once in that chain of command. I really liked it. Tim's the guy, about the only show that I didn't uh, cover for because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting up at three thirty in the morning to go do a show. Nobody wants to listen to Fan and first thing in the morning. Like, no, I, you know, as a <laughs> taking the listenership into consideration, I went, yeah, I'll do anyone's show. And I did everyone's show, but uh, Tim, so you don't want to listen to me. Uh, that's hysterical. Let's just start out quick introduction. Who are you and what, what are you all about? How'd you get here, man? Uh, my name is Mark Wood. Uh, I own three restaurants uh, throughout the Niagara region, uh, the 40 Public House in Grimsby, uh, 
Grantham House in the north end of St. Catharines and the office tap and grill downtown St. Catharines. Uh, and we obviously uh, were hooked up today because uh, I'm going on a gigantic public rant and rave about the unprofessionalism and, uh, and, and lack of forethought that's being put into some of these decisions by uh, a majority of the people sitting in uh, political power these days. I could uh, bore you with the rest of my restaurant resume, but it's just a resume. <laughs> um, no, so I, I'm familiar with all of them. So you've got the office, which I'm familiar. Uh, well, I've known Greg since the powwow days, so I don't know. You must have been, had been involved at some level with him. I'm a big fan of his. Uh, uh, yeah, Greg was great. Uh, I just purchased the office off him back in September. Oh, did you? Yeah, good. I don't know. I don't know Greg super well by any means, but uh, he was quite a. He was quite a gentleman through the entire process. He was very useful and, uh, and helpful in, uh, in passing the, the place on to somebody uh, new that was interested in stepping in there and breathing a little life back into it. So uh, Greg treated us very well. Yeah, we had a mutual friend in Alex Kazam, too. He mentioned you the other day. And then I was listening for Chrissy to say your name. I'm like, Mark Wood. I'm like, Wood? Wood? Okay. I think I know the guy. Yeah, to be honest, Jimmy, looks super familiar. I get the feeling we've crossed paths at some point in our lives. Well, I think I might be getting you confused with Woody that used to ha what used to run the kitchen at the Pepper back in the day. Yes, not me. Although Definitely I Woody. spend uh, no, that's spend what I said to Alex. I'm when I was younger. Because that's Woody, not Woodsy. Anyways, you go by that. Yeah, I've seen you around quite a bit. So, anyway, talk to me a little bit about your frustration of the current uh, uh, state in Niagara. I know we've had some lockdown uh, provisions that have come down from the province. I'm not sure exactly what they are. Some uh, establishments have been making the news by saying Niagara only. We did that with the beaches this year. I'm just like, I'm frustrated uh, as a, as recently come center right in my politics from far left, that our liberties are just being ripped from us. We're this with the lockdowns, we're going to kill more people than, than the virus does. And yeah, I don't know. It, how you guys there are seems doing. to be, it's, it's bad enough that the average media source isn't paying any attention to anything besides COVID, which means the only thing people get to see and hear on a daily basis is how many new cases there were, how many outbreaks there were, and, and they misuse a lot of words. Outbreak is the most overrated uh, word of 2020. Two people at a school or two people at a long-term care facility is not an outbreak. It is, it is contagious, it is contamination, it is, it is a lot of things you can use to describe what's happening there. But we're throwing around sensationalized words to scare people into tuning back in to hear more stats about COVID when no one is doing any justice to all of the other things that are happening because of the COVID lockdowns. Starting with just the general lack of, of your rights. Your rights are being ripped away by people uh, without any, any thought of any kind. You're, you're talking about unemployment, you're discussing poverty, you're discussing hunger, you're discussing uh, domestic abuse situations that are ongoing. There's just so many things that are happening from the consequences of some of these lockdowns and controls that it's mind blowing that no one's talking about them because everyone just wants to tune in to see how high the COVID number got this week. It, uh, it's created a very shitty situation. And when you go all the way back to March when these things obviously began, it was easier to understand. The pandemic was new. Nobody knew what was actually going on. People needed time to make sure that the public was safe while they put a plan of action together. And we can say whatever we want about there needing to be a handbook for stuff like this, but this stuff like this isn't the same every time. It happens at different times. It affects different people. So I was willing to excuse having some of my rights yanked away from me earlier in March and April when it's only fair to give the people in charge an opportunity to figure out what's going on and how to deal with it properly. But uh, it's November now. And I need someone to be responsible for your actions. One person, Dr. Haraji can't just decide on his own that he thinks personally that, that restaurants are a danger to society. And without anyone else's support or conviction, he's able just to sign a piece of paper and make that happen. It's mind blowing to me that that's even a thing. Well, we'll get back to that too. I appreciate your takes. What have you learned? Because we've all, hey, we didn't know what this thing was going to do. We, we, we kind of forecast... 2 million deaths based on a three to 7% death rate. Now we know that it's much less than that. We were a little unprepared because nothing like this has ever happened before. So we're kind of learning as we go. What do you find that you've shifted on that you were like, I was really worried in the beginning that this could kill me. And so I've shifted a lot because the mortality rates come down. The asymptomatic rate has gone through the roof. They're talking about 10 times the people that are actually uh, tested positive are out there asymptomatically. 
Uh, we don't know if that's going to have long-term effects, like come back on you like shingles and chicken pox does. But Great. what's some of the things you've learned and shifted your beliefs on that you're maybe when it first came out, you might have been you know, worried about. And now you're like, no, this is all crap. Um, you know, when it, when it started, it was obviously when you don't know what's happening, you need to take a certain amount of precautions. Uh, I think another reason that I'm so upset about how they keep attacking my industry is the fact that of all the workplaces in Ontario, we're one of the few that, that already have to deal with this. We're one of the few people that are actually regulated by public health 12 months a year. I have certifications and testings and courses and procedures. I understand how to not let viruses and bacteria contaminate things. It's part of what we do for a living. So uh, most restaurants are actually already prepared to tackle this and there's less of a learning curve because you, we already understand what it means to have to sanitize everything and have to make sure we wash our hands every five minutes and make sure that we're, we're avoiding unnecessary contact with things that could be a concern, including customers, including raw food products in the kitchen, all of these things that we're already aware of. So at first, when, when the rules start to come in place and uh, you just, you have to wait and see what's going on. I'm, I'm a reasonable person. At first, I didn't know what to expect and I tried not to jump to conclusions. So I just kind of did what I was told. Right. It, uh, it started with shutting down the restaurant. Then it, then it went to people can't go, you know, people can't go out and they can't sit in a dining room because that's bad for you. And whether or not I believed it was irrelevant. But uh, since the restaurants reopened for takeout, I've been in contact with people seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I have three different locations. I work seven days a week, up to 60, 70 hours a week now because I can't afford to pay people to do jobs that they used to do for me. And over the months, I see how ridiculous some of this fear is and some of these regulations that are coming in place. I still have yet to actually see anybody sick. I personally know hundreds of people. I talk to hundreds of people a week. I, don't, I no longer fear what's happening because I'm washing my hands. I'm sanitizing the place the way we're supposed to. My staff are in masks. Everything's proper and fine. The regulations that we're in control to make sure that the social distancing and, and some very basic uh, safety protocols made sure that that fear has been removed from me for months. I have no concerns who's coming into my restaurant. I don't care what city they come from. I don't care who they are. Assuming they're not coughing the lungs out in the way in the front door, I'm not afraid to go and speak to these people. Because even if one of them happens to have COVID, odds of me getting it under those conditions are almost zero. Well, I would agree with you there. And I think this is, you know, I said before you came on live, I had a very close friend of mine the other day tried to convince me that the airborne transmission was the main source of transmission through this. And you know how difficult it is to get an airborne virus? Like you have to touch someone. <laughs> you have to touch something they touched. Like, one of, especially when it comes to restaurants. One of the, one of the stories that I've been telling a lot, and uh, there's a very large commercial restaurant chain in Niagara Falls. They had a couple employees back in, uh, the dates are relevant to the story, but I want to say late July, early August, when falls tourism was still going pretty strong. Uh, and two employees at said restaurant uh, contaminated COVID. Um, once the public health came in to do their trace that they do with everybody, as per why we're taking names and numbers, they tracked the other 50 employees. They tracked everyone at every table that was in the building, why these two employees were sick and in uh, and involved in serving these, and we're talking the falls in the middle of summer, thousands of customers came and went from this restaurant. Hundreds of employees worked side by side with these two people that we know for a fact had COVID and COVID symptoms and tested positive on more than one occasion. And not a single other person in that space got sick. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. The staff were washing, they were wearing masks, they were sanitizing the tables and all of the surfaces that customers come in contact with. And knowing that two people walked around there full time, 40 hours a week with COVID and still didn't give it to anybody with very simple, very reasonable measures to allow people to keep that in check. Sanitizing, bleaching, wiping, a simple mask. I think there's a lot of instances where the masks are being uh, incredibly overused. They've become a very vocal symbol for some people trying to protect themselves and other people bitching about their rights. I don't care if you, I don't care what you want me to wear on my face. If you don't take away my legal right to make a living in this country. Talk to me a little bit about the impact. I don't need you to get specific on numbers, maybe percentages. What maybe your gross sales, like really what has logistically, how's this come down for you? I can, I could break it down to the exact penny for you if you like. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have to market every month, and and what little support we're still getting from the government is is absolutely uh, instrumental in, in ensuring that uh, I can still pay the rent. 
Really? Um, oh, money's nice. gone. Uh, um, one of my restaurants is down 68% in sales from last year at this time. Um, the other one is down 49% in sales from last year at this time. And all of this was before Dr. Haraji decided to open his mouth yesterday and announced to the entire Niagara region that he believes going to restaurants is, is not safe for you or your well-being or your families. It's not just the controls you put in place. The way the announcement was made, that the entire mode behind and feeling behind the announcement suggests that he also wants to personally tack on that he thinks it's dangerous to go out to restaurants. And I don't understand where the hatred comes for restaurants. I think the average person, because restaurants aren't governed and regulated by a single body, the average person forgets how important the hospitality industry is to driving the economy in this province. The restaurants, the employees, the, the food suppliers, the LCBOs, the beer stores, the craft breweries, the wineries, the advertising companies we use, the marketing companies we use, the cleaning companies we use. We purchase, my, any one of my small restaurants does business and interchanges revenue with 50 to 60 other companies that all rely on restaurants being open to also help them out. So when, when people downplay what's happening, when someone says, oh, what's the big deal? You can't go out to a restaurant now. Just go home and have a burger and a beer. What's the big deal? You just, you, you go back out to restaurants when they reopen. I'm not just discussing the social ramifications of this, which are also a big deal. Because in an era and a year where mental health is going down the toilet, because people are having these extra stresses and unemployment rates thrust upon them, an occasional 15 minutes at the local bar with someone that is in your bubble that you know is safe and clean having a beer isn't hurting anybody. In fact, I'll go so far as to say restaurants and bars are actually helping people's mental health situations. Out. Absolutely, man. Gavin McInnes made this point. Um, months ago when they closed the bars like this is <laughs> you got guys in routines people in routines this is their stop on the way home and you, you've ripped their social time like he, he was saying you know jack the janitor is one of my boys i see on a regular basis i i know jack because i see him and you're taking that social interaction i went to the cenotaph yesterday or on remembrance day and I guess I'm an extrovert. I'm trying to convince myself that I'm not, but <laughs> I was so freaking charged up after going out to lunch with a friend of mine and a new friend that she was with and stopped by Wellington court and had my Caesar salad and that's it. No beer. And I was so cranked up. I'm like, this is what isolation does to someone. It yeah. makes you crazy. So, can you speak again, not specifically, but to some of the impact on you, your family and your staff mentally, as far as, you know, every 30 days we get a new announcement from day one, when they just shut us right down uh, from March. Now there's every, at least once a week, I, I have a, I have pretty close to a full fledged breakdown because I don't even know what to do as an entrepreneur. You know, you got to be able to, to move quick. You got to be able to change dec decisions and change directions and take advantage of opportunities. But that's when you're in a natural realm where you have the ability to control certain things going on. I literally wake up every morning with anxiety, trying to figure out what the government's going to do to guarantee that I go bankrupt today. <laughs> I've, I, on March 16th, when we got the news, on March 17th, um, I laid off every single employee I had. I looked almost 40 people in the eye and said, guys, I'm sorry you don't have jobs anymore, effective immediately, and I have no idea when you're coming back to work. We tried to run takeout and delivery for a little while with a, with as small a staff as humanly possible because takeout and delivery doesn't, doesn't bring in enough revenue to even pay the utilities, let alone any extra fees that, that come with operating an actual business. But it seemed to make sense to me at the time to try to fight and to try to at least keep the place open and keep some product rotating and keep our name out in the public so when all of this washed over, people wouldn't forget us or be concerned that we disappeared during this because a lot of places closed their doors and never reopened. Mm -hmm. So the... The, the stress on me and my family is, is mind blowing. I do my best to keep, uh, to keep it to myself uh, when I can. My wife's aware of the situation that we deal with, but I try not to bring too much of that home because I don't want them stressing about it as much as I do. I also need a safe zone where I can go and try not to be reminded of how stressful this is. And I've got, other, I've got employees that are in bad spots. I got employees that I still haven't brought back to work since March. And now the region wants to, wants to cut 50% more of my business off, maybe more. We're talking Christmas. You don't think, getting back to the social interaction, you don't think people are going to have insane breakdowns over the holidays when they have to stay at home 
maybe they live by themselves. They don't, they don't feel comfortable going to visit their own family. They can't walk into a restaurant and have dinner with their parents or their cousins or their brothers and sisters because they don't share the same living address. That's, it's, it's just asinine. There's, no, there's not a single fact or shred of evidence to support most of the new rules that they're putting on us right now. 14 people, I believe, was the total that they were able to trace back to restaurants from COVID in Niagara region. We're talking Niagara region. 14 would be a number that I would think about uh, addressing seriously if it was 14 in Grimsby. Okay, we got a problem out here. Let's figure out where these 14 people are and, and make sure everyone's safe and, and send some people over there to make sure we're okay. Niagara region's a pretty big space, 14. There are presently four people in all of Niagara region hospitalized for COVID. And my heart goes out to them. I don't want anyone out there to believe that I don't think that COVID's not real. COVID is real. COVID is very serious for certain people with certain existing conditions and other people that have conditions they don't even know about. This needs to be taken seriously. I'm not suggesting that we just throw all the regulations out the window and go back to business as usual. People need to be able to pay attention to this. But there's a difference between paying attention to something with realistic stats and just making shit up because you want to act like you've got it under control when very obviously the province and the feds and the municipality don't have it under control. So they're literally just throwing rules at the wall to see what, what looks good the next day because people are more actively engaged in thinking that the problem's being solved as long as these guys keep implementing new rules. Those things don't go hand in hand. More rules doesn't solve the problem, especially if the rules aren't based on actual facts and are being targeted towards the wrong people. Mark, give us the distinction between, in addition to, the restrictions that you're faced on from the province. I don't know if we've got any federal ones or do we? And I get that you guys have a high level of um, standards as far as cleanliness and cross-contamination and all that kind of stuff. So you're already practicing a lot of this stuff. Yeah, you got to implement a mask and sanitizers at the door and stuff like that. But talk to us a little bit about the restrictions that have come down provincially versus what uh, the doctor, the public uh, doctor of public health did at the region, which I don't think is actually a mandate, right? It's just he's sc scaring people with news. Like he's not passing bylaws or anything. Oh, no, that's legislation. That's a law. Well, okay. He, so has, he has the right based on, based on outdated uh, legislation that exists as the officer that oversees the health of public. He's allowed to put legislation in place without the consent of the Niagara Regional Council or the city. Wow. Wow without a state of emergency declared or anything at any time, a doctor can go, you know what? Okay. No one leave their house. This is a grotesque ab abuse of power by a narcissist that either honestly believes the horse shit that he thinks is happening right now, or is just trying to get his name in the paper because he's upset that all the other doctors in the province are getting headlines too, because there's no logic to this. And if he's got some logic, it's about time he stood up and, and, and defended himself. Cause frankly, I mean, and a lot of other people are going to come after this guy and I'm not going to be okay with this man until I see him driving out of Niagara region and apologizing to everyone that got shut down on his way out. Awesome. Okay. Tell, talk to us about what the, the restrictions, my apologies. <laughs> uh, the province, I think did a really uh, piss poor job to start. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. They threw a bunch of rules together. They wanted to make it seem like they were trying to control things. They did the same thing. Restaurants was the first industry that they said they were shutting down and paring back on with zero evidence at this point that restaurants had anything to do with anything. They didn't even know what they were fighting. So the uh, major international airport's still open. You can fly in from China right from the, the epicenter of the pandemic and get off a plane in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. But as a taxpayer, you can't walk into a restaurant and buy a meal because that's dangerous for you. So I don't want to hear any that all of these rules were put in place to protect your health because there's not. And there was tons of many more accurate things they should have done if their only concern were people's health. Regardless, as I said, I get that this was a little unprecedented. People are just making decisions because they need to seem like they're in charge and they need to seem like they have the public's interest at heart. And I can appreciate that. So a couple months into it, they start to relax. They go to these phases. We're in phase one, we're in phase two, we're in phase three. The phases become a bit of a joke because they're yo-yoed and so many people can put their two cents in on whether or not they think it's time for a region to go back to two or back to three. They eventually corrected their problem in the fact that they recognized that the phases could be done uh, geographically by region as opposed to blanketing larger commercial areas because you can't get mad at everybody because one area isn't under control. And at least they recognize that and I can appreciate it. They didn't do a great job of enforcing uh, some of the problems, but at the very least, 
They started by recognizing that the entire province didn't need to open and shut down as a collective. There were plenty of places that were fine to continue to operate business. So then the province goes and spends a few weeks actually analyzing stuff. And I believe for the very first time, releases statistics about what their contact tracing has actually accomplished. And now there's a conversation about where people actually got sick that we know about and what industries and what buildings uh, and what uh, long-term care facilities and what hospitals. So there's actually information now that they've had for longer than they should have, but at least somebody in the province woke up, decided to release that to the public and say, hey guys, we're gonna start using this information when it comes to making new regulations. So the province spends a couple of weeks and they come up with a new color system. There's five different levels of, uh, of lockdown and concern and regulation. They're going to be reevaluated every 14 days. Assuming that your area is, is improving, you take a step down. If your area is not improving, you either stay the same or you take a step up to a more severe uh, status. And this is being based on some statistical analysis and numbers. So for the first time, somebody at the government actually said, we're actually gonna look at real cases, not just feelings and social media posts. And we're gonna try to make decisions that are best for that area, taking everything into consideration. For the first time, they actually might've admitted that the doctor's recommendation isn't the only one that matters. The doctor's sole job is to get as few people sick as possible. Our elected officials' jobs are to take information from every single industry and every single expert they can get their hands on and then make the correct decision for society based on a balanced level of information that takes everything into account, not just one doctor's advice. So they roll out the new color program, which is pretty good. Green's pretty safe, pretty calm. Yellow's a slightly enhanced uh, awareness of what's happening, which only comes with a few restrictions. You can go up to orange, which turns in other things and so on. So after the province makes mistakes for months, finally put some effort into launching what I believe to be the best system that's been released in Canada so far for acknowledging where we're at and what we need to do next. And without even getting through the first 14 day trial period at the color coding that Niagara or St. Catharines is on at this point, the doctor steps in and unilaterally just signs legislation that causes all of that to mean nothing. We don't even literally get through the first 14 day trial period. And this moron wants to step up and make sure that everyone knows that he's in charge and you're gonna play by his rules. And, and then he just disappears. Here's a public announcement from Dr. Haraji. Now, nobody speak to me because I, I don't, I'm busy at home collecting my $250,000 a year annual taxpayer salary. Um, I don't understand the recent lockdowns. I can't even argue them out loud because I would start laughing at some point, the ridiculousness of you having people that you work beside or family that you spend all day beside that you can go to the grocery store with, you can walk into a bank with, you can walk, you can, you can go anywhere. You can walk into a Tim Hortons with, you can, you can go shopping with, you can go to the mall. You and 5,000 of your best friends can go stand in line at the new Costco in Niagara Falls without masks and swarm the place so you can save 25% off 36 rolls of toilet paper, but you're not allowed to walk in the front door of my restaurant together because somehow that's the moment when you become a danger to, to yourself and the rest of society. There's zero logic into that whatsoever. And this man literally needs to resign and get his ass out of Niagara region. Settle down, Mr. Political Activist. Tell me, have you ever been engaged politically at any level before as an activist or someone that's getting a word out? Are you just a good, I don't know, are you a right-leaning guy politically? Can you talk about that? Does it even matter? But like, a, a, more importantly, have you ever been a mouthpiece for any action before? I, I, think, I think the problem with why I, I'm going to lead with an initial no is that I am a mouthpiece for a lot of things and I'm uh, reasonably opinionated uh, and I, I want the best for everyone around me and what's going on. Without saying political, I've definitely been in a situation where um, I'm a member of the Business Association in Grimsby. I'm a board member. I was the chair for years. Uh, I've recently been appointed to the Downtown Association in St. Catharines, so I'm involved in the community there. Um, I've been an ambassador for the Greater Niagara Chamber. I'm a member of the Lincoln Chamber uh, and Grimsby Chamber as well. I'm, I'm very actively involved in networking and paying, and paying attention to what's going on in the community to try to get involved. I have very rarely used it for, uh, used it for political purposes or for any sort of, of attempt to, to rally attention. Uh, having said that, I did have some very serious concerns with uh, the way Grimsby was being operated uh, at the start of this. 
uh, and some of the bylaw regulations they put in place this year, which actually prevented us from reopening for a short period of time in the middle of summer. So for the first time, uh, maybe in my entire career, uh, I tried to use my, my networking and my personal connections to lobby the, the town to uh, pull their heads out of their behinds and, and actually do what most other municipalities were doing at the time, which was uh, trying to help out. And instead of creating new rules, just get off your seat and come out and see what's going on and pay attention to what's actually happening in business and change some of them. Uh, Grimsby was, uh, at the end of the day, receptive to, to what I did. Um, I wasn't the only one by any means. I had a lot of good help in, in helping make some of those things happen. But I'd like to think, at least initially, I was the, uh, I was the magnet that drew a lot, of people, uh, a lot of people's attention to that cause. Uh, and it worked out quite well for a lot of the businesses because of that. So I'm hoping this will be the same thing. Uh, political or not political future, um, I, I need to make sure that people are understand the actual facts of what's happening, um, the actual consequences of what's happening, how many industries and how many people are being affected by this and to what extent. I need to remove the general public's notion that just not going out to a restaurant and, and picking up some food and going at home really isn't that big of a hit to anybody or anything. Uh, it's a gigantic industry that's been beaten to, get to death for eight months already. So I'm going to maybe somewhere down the road, uh, turn some of my newfound mild fame into a political career. But for the time being, I just want to spread as much of the truth as I can get my hands on so that I can collect a number of names to put together. So when I petition the region and the city uh, before the day's out, that they know that my message has been heard by many people and they're all standing beside me. And voters and taxpayers are going to be standing beside me waiting to see something happen here. And I'm not going away this time. I'm not going to just, by Monday, I'm not going to get bored and go find something else to do. I'm going to make sure that somebody at the region hears my voice every day somehow until this goes away or until this idiot doctor goes away. One of the two. Well, you got my vote if you run for any level, brother. On uh, first impressions, just based solely on our 20 minutes or so that we've spent together so far, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Give me your thoughts. It's kind of off topic, but I appreciate your thoughts on this because you're an opinionated guy. Your thoughts on these BIAs and chambers of commerce and and the boards that you sit on that are, you know, they're good for networking events and they're good if you got a mailing list and you don't usually share the mailing list, even though you're a member, you know, you can't say to the chamber, Hey, can I, uh, can I send an email to the members? They're like, no, pay us $200. Yeah. You know, um, I went through that circuit and stuff. So tell me as a business owner, I know you got to belong to these things so that you're seen and you have an opportunity to have a business after five at one of your places if you do that kind of thing. But what are your thoughts on these associations, these BIAs, downtown associations, chambers, and stuff like that? I think, um, I think some of the mandates for many of them are outdated. I think some of them are still trying to function like a lot of people in, in many industries, the same way they function for the last 40, 50 years. And there needs to be an understanding of what people that are involved in a, in a chamber or, or any sort of association, what it is they're actually looking for. Uh, networking is useful, but uh, in, in the era of social media, networking happens so fast and on such a broader level than it ever used to. You know, it's not, it's not 1986 anymore. You don't need to go down to the local coffee shop and, have a, and have, a, have a coffee and shake someone's hand to understand who they are and what they do for a living. You know, people's profiles, you get things, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Thing, things like LinkedIn, where you can immediately just find a hundred people that do whatever it is you need to, to get done. So I think some of them have adapted gracefully and some of them have not. Uh, I think the biggest difference here, obviously, uh, for your, your general listening crowd that uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, a chamber is more of a, as a voluntary membership um, situation. So if the, if the chamber doesn't actually have anything that works out well for you, you, you can come and go as you please. Uh, membership, depending on what you do for a living, can be quite useful, and, or, or it might not be, depending on, I think different industries approach it differently. I do think chambers need to reevaluate uh, and be much more service focused going forward, as opposed to just networking focused, because there's got to be something else you're bringing to the table for, for a return on your investment in 2020. Uh, the difference that chambers obviously have with BIAs is that uh, BIAs are, are regulated by the municipality. Uh, there's actually a budget that comes with that. A percentage of corporate tax gets put into a, into a levy, and that money is used by the board of a BIA to actually be able to offer improvements, beautification, marketing for specific business areas. Uh, I think those are still very useful for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think that small business owners can occasionally just get lost taking care of their own business and not realizing that maybe some assistance in a bigger picture matter is something that would benefit their business also. 
having a board of people with some history and some experience to know how to communicate and can help do things to drive um, marketable concepts in, in geographical areas, I, I think is still very useful. Uh, obviously, maybe in a slightly different fashion. Uh, I know the Downtown Association was very key in helping to arrange the St. Paul Street shutdown this summer so that a lot of the smaller restaurants and cafes could do what they could to try to take advantage of whatever bodies still happen to be downtown. Uh, and I think sometimes when you just have that united voice uh, and it doesn't hurt to have a couple bucks in a bank account as well, you need to be able to do things and execute things and you need to be able to draw people together so that you can approach even the municipalities about things like this. I'm very obviously gonna get as many BIAs as possible uh, on board and in the link with what's happening right now because they actually represent the small business owners. And for every time a restaurant gets shut down, there's another customer that's just afraid to go out in public. So there's someone that's not going into the clothing store next door. There's someone that's not going into the bakery on the corner because they just keep hearing that it's dangerous. Don't go out, don't do this, places in, in public are dangerous. And so we stop sending that message businesses as a whole are going to suffer and they're going to suffer in ways people can't even understand small businesses are going to be worse because they tend to and i don't mean this as an insult to my my peers and, and my fellow brothers and sisters out there small businesses tend to be run by people that are good at what they do specifically not necessarily people with gigantic financial backgrounds so i think there's a lot of small businesses out there right now where people are actually unaware of where they stand financially at this point and there's going to be some real big eye openers if the economy continues to be put on halt by people that are sitting at home cashing taxpayer paychecks. Don't take your quarter million dollars a year and go to your summer home and tell me that it's not that big a deal if my industry closes down for six to eight more weeks. Because that's not true and you don't understand. And the, the people making these rules and making these judgments are not only usually civil servants, which means their paycheck isn't at question for five seconds. But they're people that live in different actual income brackets than the people that they're controlling. And I'm tired of watching these people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year pass judgment on someone that's got to go to work seven days a week to try to make sure that my employees are taken care of and the lights are on. What, uh, what's the last political thing that fired you up? Like politically, you see some issues out there. Before this, what's something that you took an interest in? Um, I've been uh, paying some attention recently, uh, not recently, most of the year, to the gigantic amount of uh, laws that our prime minister has decided to break this year and get away with it. Uh, and I tend not to speak too much about political parties as, uh, as a business operator. But the last thing that really caught my attention was how blind most, uh, most Canadian supporters were uh, and how quick we were to jump on all of the terrible things that Trump did in the States. It's easy to, it's easy to throw stones from this side of the fence. But the gentleman running our country is a criminal. He broke the law. I just don't understand how that's not news in Canada right now. I realize COVID's a pretty big topic of conversation, but CBC has been covering it 24 hours a day for the last eight months. Can they slip in for five minutes that the prime minister actually should be in jail? Is that a conversation anybody wants to have? Oh, sure. I, don't, I don't understand. How is that not news? I know it's not news because the liberal government actually pays to support the CBC, so they can't talk bad about anybody that is the only reason that their lights are still on. So uh, that kind of creates a bad situation. But politically, I tend not to be too, too super active. Um, I want to support local people that I think do right by people. Uh, I, I've, been, uh, I've been a conservative most of my life, but there's plenty of things that many other parties have done that I can appreciate and get behind. Uh, I, you know, the, the Liberal Party, I, I'm good with. The NDP Party, I'm good with. I just don't understand how everyone in Canada is going crazy about the fact that Donald Trump almost got reelected when the entire time there's still a criminal run in Canada. I don't understand. Well, we don't have uh, much political engagement in Canada. I don't feel maybe I just shared the screen with you right now. I don't know if you can see it. I'm can. sharing thing on, um, on zoom, but and I was talking about before you came on, I'm going to hover over these cases. This was the first wave, right? So we see in March 12th, and we see the peak. We've got about 2,000 cases per day, let's say. Mm. And then this is world meters. We'll see the corresponding time peaks at, well, let's call it a couple hundred deaths. Let me fly up here to this second round. Second wave, I guess. These are new daily cases, not cumulative. So let's call it 4,000 for a rough, I mean, it's over that, but not by much. 
And then if we fly down here again, look at the cases, the deaths. Yeah. So we had, we have right now four times the infection rate from 4,000, from 2,000, and a quarter, 200 deaths to 50. No, well, uh, yeah, this, the, the chart you're looking at, if somebody looked at this chart and told you we were knee deep in a second wave, if this was the only stat you were looking at, you would automatically assume that they had dropped themselves on their head. There's no second wave on this chart you're looking at right here. Having said that, I'm not foolish to the number of new actual daily cases. But the average person, and the problem with what's going on right now is everyone out there gets to cherry pick what stat best backs up what they said. The one chart you're looking at right here in front of you with daily cases would suggest, well, first off, it's Canada. So you would have to look at Niagara region ones before you would believe a single word Dr. Karaji said about how he thinks he's just here to protect society. Um, but there's other things that need to be taken into account. First off, the number of tests are also a concern. If, if back in April when we're doing 5,000 tests a day, and 2,000 people are sick, that's great. But if we just did 45,000 tests yesterday, we're gonna find more people that test positive, especially when you take into account the whole, a whole laundry list of other concerns. The coronavirus, um, Corona-19 is just one version of a bunch of different strains of coronaviruses that have existed for years. There's also uh, plenty of reference made to the fact that there's certain strains of influenza that will also test positive for COVID. Also keeping in mind that if you have the antibodies from either of these viruses, you may also test positive. So we're getting all of these new positive tests because we're testing more people, we're trying to make sure that we're in front of it, but people are testing positive and being sent home because they're asymptomatic for any one of a pile of different reasons. Maybe they had a form of coronavirus five years ago and they have antibodies built up inside. Maybe they have, uh, maybe they have flu antibodies, maybe they just have the flu. People, are being, people aren't dying because the testing is not 100% accurate to whether or not you have the virus today and whether or not you are contagious today. The test just shows that you have, you have antibodies in your system or the, or the actual virus in your system that may or may not be something related to COVID-19 and, and may or may not actually, you may or may not actually carry symptoms for and you may or may not be contagious. So there's a lot of may or may nots in this sentence, but you have to understand that if you cherry pick stats, it's easy to prove a point. We need to take all of them into consideration. We have more positives. Why do we have more positives? Is it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? Let's see if we can narrow that down. Where obviously you said it yourself, we're up to four times the amount of positive tests in a day, but we're down to 25% of the mortality rate. How did that change? Well, it probably didn't change. It probably means that one or two of the stats that we're putting all of our faith in are just being misled by some other factor that we're not making known to, to the public right now, as per the possibility of other COVID strains coming up positive. People could have had COVID-19 last year because it was on the planet before it became a pandemic. There are plenty of people out there that are under the impression that they got this before it became news. And they would still test positive for having COVID-19 in their system. There's a lot of things going on here that we don't understand, but every time you see one stat roll across a news screen with some politician telling you that they made a decision based on that one stat, I wouldn't let my three-year-old come at me with one stat and make a decision, let alone an elected official that's surrounded by millions of dollars and, and hundreds of professionals that are supposed to be there to guide them with professional advice. It just doesn't make sense. So the smartest thing that, that you would do to anybody is what you just did to me here. Here's more than one point of reference for what's happening. So before we have a conversation about how we're going to react to what's happening, let's get more information. Because when we make stupid decisions on a lack of information, we're just cherry picking shit to prove our point. And that's not the kind of thing that grownups, especially elected officials, are supposed to be able to get away with. Brother, um, back to Dr. Herpes or whatever his name is. What's the mandate? What did he bring down? I don't think we've been specific about what it actually is that you're... Uh, the latest changes uh, to restaurants, in addition to the fact the province already mandated that we had to close at 11 o'clock, so there's no late night, that's fine. They've already mandated certain protocols for sanitization and uh, enhanced sanitizer and masks. Uh, the doctor wants to make sure that you're not allowed to go into a restaurant unless you're with somebody that you live with. That's the only excuse for you to be going out into a public food service area now. So if you have a girlfriend that you don't live with, you're not allowed to go out in public with them. 
if you have a son that's old enough that you don't live with them, you're not allowed to go out and have a Christmas dinner or Christmas drink with your son. If you have cousins, neighbors, family, people that already exist well within your social bubble that you are 100% confident in being in the proximity of, you're not allowed to go out. If someone comes into my restaurant effective uh, Saturday at midnight, I have to ask them for their ID. And if they show me driver's licenses with two different addresses on it, I have to ask them to leave. What? They're already together. They came in together. They're going to leave together. But while they're in my building, them sitting at the same table is a danger to society. <laughs> so let's, let's make sure we don't let anyone get away with that. Now, then they, uh, they add on a couple other smaller uh, restrictions. They've restricted total, total tables to six. They've removed the possibility of all indoor events. Uh, which the province actually changed regulations on in the summer because there was too many complaints about people having weddings they couldn't attend. Frankly, unfortunately, people passing away and you couldn't have a service for these people because people weren't allowed to be in the same place at the same time. So the extension towards indoor parties uh, has been removed. You're only allowed to have six people at a table, which is going to be unlikely anyway because um, you all have to live in the same house. So the only way six people can come in is if they literally all sit, share the same address. Um, They've removed the idea that, bar that barriers between tables is good enough. So all tables need to be, if you've got a couple booths and, you've got, and you just spent a lot of money putting plexiglass up, that plexiglass is no longer useful. You have to make sure there's a minimum of two meters between every single table, regardless of what measures you've already paid for and put in place. Plexiglass suppliers have been gouging restaurants for six months, obviously, because there's never been a bigger call for plexiglass than there is in 2020 in Canada, that's for sure. And then he went and the sweeping legislation, which was made single-mindedly, has already been actively put in place till January 1st. So we're not talking about Monday. I'm not saying you can't go out and have, have lunch with your family on Tuesday. I'm saying that you immediately need to cancel any plan you had to socialize with anybody you know that you don't live with, any family members you have, between now and after the Christmas holidays. I don't understand because even the province, as they discussed going into this, was smart enough to put a 14 day um, period on their, on their change of level of case because they wanted to be able to reevaluate what 14 days would do and whether or not there was a need to alter what, where they were at that point. One of the smartest things the province has done is admitted that conditions can change and the reactions need to change accordingly. This man, almost in an effort to make sure that he gets to take Christmas off, because I guarantee you he's not working for the three weeks over the holidays while he's at home with his quarter million dollar a year salary. He's already decided that it's till January 1st, because frankly, if somebody just asked him to reevaluate it halfway through, that might interrupt his holidays. Dude, I'm going to get you to wrap up with a two minute, uh, not right now, but uh, cause I want to hear where you want to go with this, but I want to set you up just before you're gone. Give me, give me your two minute elevator pitch without worrying that you're going to repeat yourself of something you've already said. If you're going to become a public speaker and an activist and a champion for Liberty, which is what I believe that you're doing. I can't believe that so many people have gotten in line to wear a mask, in the beach, I mean, in the water on the beach, in their cars, without even doing their own research, just, just look into the efficacy. Is that the, the effectiveness of the mask? It's crazy. Um, but before we get there, before I set you up for that, because I think this is important and it's something I can clip later. And, you know, if you even keep it to a 60 second elevator pitch, even better, because then it'll fit on your Instagram. Um, but this, you know, this conversation's going out live on multiple platforms now and will be available later so people can re-listen to it. But what my next question to you, what do you hope to accomplish? Okay. So we, we know the logistics uh, and, the kind of single handedness of what's come down to Niagara. What do you hope to accomplish with what you're doing and how are you doing it? What's your plan? Well, I've, uh, I've spoken to a few elected officials already in the last 24 hours uh, about their personal beliefs and where they stand. Uh, and there's a few MPPs actually having a group conversation this afternoon. They need to get back to me about where they, where they're willing to admit they stand as well. Sure? Um, I have started a Facebook campaign to get uh, restaurants, uh, restaurants, and bar owners and managers to reach out to me with just their name and their email address. 
Uh, a letter is being uh, formulated as we speak that's going off to every single member of the regional council and every single member of the local city council. Because this is an Niagara region thing, I will probably include some of the councillors in Grimsby and any other councillor that somebody wants to suggest. But I want to send a letter to them very clearly stating that this is a mistake. They're the only ones that have the ability to step in. And I'm going to make sure that I, I CC every single other major business restaurant owner in the Niagara region on this. I need them to reach out to me, guys. Uh, Mark Wood on Facebook. I just check out my last post. It's not particularly long-winded. It doesn't need to be. If you believe what we're doing, it, the situation we're in is incorrect, I need you to reach out to me with your name and number, uh, uh, name and email address, so that I can make sure that these people know that I'm just not one guy who's fed up. It's an entire industry of people that's fed up. I'll take the heat, I'll take the lead, I'll take the heat, I'll take whatever I have to here. But I'm not going to stop talking to any single person that represents the Niagara region until this legislation is backed up again. People need to stop automatically throwing restaurants on the table the minute they need to prove that they're taking more steps to control public safety. Restaurants aren't the issue. They've never been the issue. They're still not the issue. There are a couple situations that have been singled out in, in hotspot regions where restaurants might have caused a problem. Please step in and take care of those. That's your job. You put legislation in place to stop that in the first place, back it up. Go and police it yourself. Send, hire more police. I don't care. Stop punishing people that are doing everything correctly and not actually endangering anybody. But I'm not going to rest here until this is gone. Haraji's either removed or he steps up and apologizes for making a unilateral decision. And he doesn't answer to Niagara Council, and it's the first thing the council's going to say. This decision wasn't made by us. I guarantee you somebody on council helped push him towards this direction, and I guarantee you there's members on council that can help push him to reverse the decision. So I don't want to hear from them, this wasn't our decision. I don't give a shit if it was your decision. You're an elected official, you're responsible for the Niagara region, the Niagara region is suffering. Niagara region took a huge blow today to the possible bounce back of the economy, to unemployed people, to hungry people, to people that are fed up with 2020. And I haven't seen a single person on Niagara Regional Council stand up and say anything about why this was bad and what they're going to do to help out. So I'm going to remind them that there's a whole lot of people on my side of the argument here, and we all vote and we all pay taxes. And if you're just sitting at home right now trying to be a fence sitter because you're on council and you don't know where everyone else stands, I'm going to tell you where everyone else stands. Grow the fuck up and do your job. Amen, brother. Can you share with, do you, will you share with us anyone that's been uh, receptive politically. I can think of a few people that would be, this is right up Randy Hillier's alley, but who's, can you share or will you share? Um, I'd rather not because in each one of the conversations I've had at this point, uh, I believe people have been very candid and very open and honest with me about, about what's going on. Fair enough. Uh, I've asked a couple of them to say a few things on the record. I did get uh, Mayor Sednick to admit to me in a conversation that he believes this was the wrong decision and, and he's in my corner to try to make sure we get the message to enough people that might be able to help overturn the situation. Uh, I know that he's been on, on both sides of the fence for different regulatory things that have happened in the last seven months, uh, but after a long conversation of what's going on, I said it very clearly. Walter, before I, I, I reference anything here, I just need you to answer a simple question that I can quote you on going forward. He's like, sure, Mark, fire away. I'm like, do you believe that this was the wrong thing to do? And he said, yes, I believe that was the wrong thing to do. I'm like, perfect, thank you so much. The other 45 minutes conversation we had with him can stay between me and him, but I need people, I need these people to know and admit out loud that they're on the side of businesses, especially businesses that don't show any statistical factor to leading towards people getting sick or dying. Well done, brother. Okay, <laughs> I respect your time. I know you're really busy, and uh, we got a lot of mutual friends. I know a lot of people that work with you. I've eaten at all your establishments, except 40. Where's 40? Grimsby, downtown, right on Main Street. Ah. A lot of people in St. Catharines are not familiar with Grimsby, so I'll try not to take that personally, brother. Yeah. yeah, where'd you start out? Where'd you come up through? Uh, I worked for a lot of big restaurant chains most of my life. Uh, okay. I started with a couple local independent places in St. Catharines when I was a kid. I got my first kitchen job at a uh, at Eddie's place that doesn't even exist anymore about 30 years ago. I lived at Eddie's place. And I've been in restaurants ever since. But uh, the first place that I was owner of would have been the 40 Public House in Grimsby. Then I moved on to the Grantham House on Secord Drive in St. Catharines. And then very recently, the office tap and grill downtown. Nice. Who were your mentors in the early days? Gary Proger? Uh, oh, Gary. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Gary went through some tough times after Eddie's went down, but yeah. I was too young to know any better when I worked for Gary. Gary was a nice guy and he took care of me, but I was 15, 16, and I had no clue what I wanted to be when I grew up or whatever, or what, where my restaurant path was going to take me. 
Uh, I, I worked under some pretty good people at Carrot Foods for a long time. I was with Kelsey's in Montana for the better part of a decade. Okay. Um, so I've learned some things. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I, I wouldn't say the word mentor, but I've learned more things from some of the people I worked for that were idiots than some of the people that I worked for that were real good at what they did. <laughs> Here's not what to do. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the what not to do is, is, a, is a screaming message that's more important than what to do. That's for sure. All right, Mark Wood is my guest. Again, tell us, give us the addresses and the public information for your businesses and then uh, give me a one minute uh, elevator pitch on what's happening, where you're going, what you're committed to and how people do Wonderful. Well, guys, again, uh, Mark Wood, I'm the owner of the 40 Public House, uh, downtown Main Street in Grimsby. Uh, the owner of the Grantham House, uh, 14 Secord Drive, uh, just off the corner of Scott and Lake and St. Catharines and the office tap and grill on James Street downtown. Um, I'm going to come at everyone right now. Please check my Facebook page, Mark Wood. Uh, please email me if you'd like. Woodsy, W-O-O-D-Z-Y at the 40 pubcom Woodsy at the Grantham House.ca. Woodsy at the office tap and grill.com. I don't care. Send me a smoke signal. I need names and contact information, preferably just an email address of anyone that thinks this needs to be corrected uh, quickly. I'm not going to stop until it's done. I want to make sure I'm representing the voice of anyone that wants to be heard now. I, I think that we've been wrong for eight solid months and it's time, it's time to remind people that uh, just because we don't have a collective body that governs our industry doesn't mean there aren't people like me out there that are willing to stand up for people. So, we're going to try to get this overturned as fast as possible. Anyone sending me an email address will be CC'd on the letter that I plan on sending out to regional and local councils this evening, which means you'll be able to tack on whatever you want. You'll have all the email addresses of, of all the counselors on that email as well, including everyone else that agreed to stand beside me in the statement. I'm probably going to word some things in there that I'll make very clear came from my mouth and not the collective. Although the idea of what we're doing, uh, everyone stands behind. I don't want to speak individually on behalf of people. I just want them to know that they agree with my message. They might not agree with some of the specific words I use, but I'm going to use whatever words necessary to make sure I get the attention of people that are letting this grotesque injustice and removal of my rights just stand the way it is. Mark Wood is my guest. Thank you, my brother. I lost your video a little while ago, but that's not a big thing. I just put up the uh, graphs that I'm sharing with you right now. So I'm going to sign off to you and my listeners at the same time. I'll get this uploaded to the other channels, but you can find it on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, DLive, just about anywhere. Brother, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Jim. If I could stop you for three seconds, would you do me a favor? If you can think of any personal political contacts that might be interested in hearing what we're trying to do, if you could forward me their email addresses as well, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I have limited, I'm a list guy. I always built lists and um, I have a, a Niagara a chain, a GNCC list that's about probably two, three years old. So it's a little dated. Uh, I'm not sure how many are on there, how many chamber members they are, but I actually physically built that one. Wow. I also have a dated list that's a couple years old for the Niagara Association of Realtors. It's a thousand members there. I got some other, you know, I've got the St. Catharines Club. It's a little dated and stuff like that. So I do have a few lists that I'm willing to share with anyone that wants to get the word out there because I find it strange that in the days when I paid a Chamber of Commerce to be a member that they wouldn't give me their list. Even if I ran for their political office, I couldn't communicate with the members unless it was done through them. So I built the list, including my own association as a realtor. Like, uh, yeah, I'm running for office. Can I get the list? Mm, no. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't have a mass communication uh, strategy anymore from the standpoint that, uh, well, I'll just leave it there. Uh, but I do have some lists that I'm willing to share with just about anybody that wants to get understood. in touch with people. And once you're done, same as at the region, you, you really have to cut and paste all those those email together. I used to have that, but it's, you know, it wouldn't do you any good now because it was a previous council, but once. Yeah, I got, I've got all the counselors at this point. If anyone listening has any personal local town or city counselors that they think should be CC'd on this, mm -hmm. any information sent to me will be utilized before I, I, I send off a message and hopefully I, I, it gets to the right people and shows support from the right people as well. And then I'll suggest to you, Randy Hillier, if you haven't reached out to him, obviously. I have not. He, 
I think this is right up his alley. Uh, I know he's very busy with other stuff, but uh, I would suggest you get a hold of him. Maybe I'll tag him later in this thing. Appreciate that. Uh, well, my pleasure, man. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for doing this and taking the, the opportunity to really deep dive on this because it's nuanced, right? And I think it's important about who you are and the story about where you came from and what you're all about and that, you know, it's important, your background, even your political leanings. And I think that's uh, that's cool. You've been honest about that. And I, you sound like me, frustrated by the left these days, kind of like in the middle, kind of politically homeless, uh, not happy with the way anyone's doing anything. I, I wanted to give Ford props in the beginning, but he just lately, he's just been falling and falling and falling all over the place. And, you know, I think the message that you've driven today, at least for me, is that these guys really aren't on the ground down here and they, what they're doing is they're picking a target and they're do they're bringing in regulations that are meaningless to look good. This is all about optics. It's all about looking good. It's all about shifting responsibility. And I here, I'll just say it. I've said it many times. We flatten the curve. We could have done with social distancing and hand washing. We didn't need to close everything down and masks are not working. I don't care. If they were working, why are the infections going up? Everyone's wearing masks. Like, don't, you know, I haven't fallen for it, but, you know, this, I, I really agree. And that's the message I got from you today that here we go. This is opportuni opportunity for politicians to do nothing about a problem that needs attention just to look good and picking a specific target that's not uh, contributing to the spread significantly. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I appreciate you. I uh, appreciate you summing that up. I might uh, steal a couple of those lines off you. <laughs> On that note, say good night now. Mark Wood, I appreciate your time. Thanks, brother. Pleasure. Thank you so much, folks. Peace out. All right. There's Mark Wood and all the contact information if you need them. How do I get out of this Zoom call? And we lost his video there. Uh, that's okay. Um, we put up some graphs. And <laughs> I did do a little Jim Fannin show before we rolled out um, here. Uh, so I'm not sure how long this episode ran, maybe an hour and a half with the interview. Mark Wood, thank you for your time, brother. That was very cool. I appreciate your takes. I agree virtually with all of them. Um, and I support you if you run for something political. I get your back. I'll give you a vote. All right. This is the, the part where the, uh, the show host says, like, subscribe, share, comment below, tag your friends. But I don't say that. What I will say, <laughs> and I don't ask for money either, but I have this Patreon account. It's a really cool account. It's called patreon.com slash free speech patreon.com slash free speech now i don't know shit about operating a patreon account like i could probably put my show up there but all this stuff is free at the moment uh, you can also go to true.tube t-r-e-w.tube that's evolving and will be ready soon but this uh, cool little patreon account that i got that's patreon.com slash free speech has never had a uh, patreon <laughs> Like, I think I've got everything set up so that my, that my bank account and everything, like I know my PayPal is definitely, because I actually had two um, donations on the PayPal to anonymous, uh, not, to a guy that was anonymous that found me on Twitter and liked the show. And he sent me a couple decent sized donations <laughs> just because he likes the shit. Um, but I've never had one to the Patreon. So I don't know what the minimum is at Patreon. <laughs> Five buck me. like. Just, I need to know that it works. Uh, okay. I do check real estate at tmagra.ca once in a while for um, an email. But basically, you know how to get a hold of me right where you're watching it. All right. I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for checking it out. Thanks, Mark Wood, for the time. Go down to, uh, if you're in St. Catharines, go hit the Grantham House and tip well. And tell them fan and say, yeah. All right. I'm out.